Uh, we're delighted to have with us uh, former Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson, uh, who I'm sure is very well known to all of you. Um, he is now the chairman of a think and do tank in Chicago uh, known as the Paulson Institute. Uh, which is uh, working to advance uh, global environmental protection and sustainable economic growth in both the United States and China and to improve relations between the two countries, better understanding. Um, he was Secretary of the Treasury under uh, President George W. Bush from July 2006 to January 2009, an inconsequential period in American financial history, um, and, um, uh, and of course spent 32 years at Goldman Sachs, including as chairman and chief executive officer um, from 1999 until he entered the treasury. Uh, he's also a lifelong conser conservationist and was chairman of the, uh, of the Nature Conservancy, among many other uh, conservation-related activities. So that's Secretary Paulson. And then uh, uh, with him on stage is David Wessel, who I think is also very well known to a Washington audience. Uh, David, a few months ago, joined the Brookings Institution as director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. Uh, but as most people know, for, um, for a few years before that, uh, 30 namely, he worked at the Wall Street Journal uh, where he covered um, economic and many other issues uh, and he won two Pulitzers along the way, which is not bad. Uh, he uh, is a frequent uh, um, participant in NPR's Morning Edition, so I'm sure you've heard him there if you hadn't read his uh, Wall Street Journal columns. So with that, I will leave the two gentlemen to uh, take Thank it you, Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Hank Paulson is just back from a trip to China, and I asked him how many times he'd been to China, and he paused for a moment and said more than 100 times, uh, both at Goldman and at Treasury, and now in pursuing uh, uh, a third career, which is, interestingly, 100% nonprofit. He has no investments in China, except I think maybe his heart a, a little bit. Um, uh, Mr. Paulson, uh, I thought I would start with the uh, remembering that you presided over, you had the helm during a, a horrible financial crisis in the United States, and we're a country that, at least we thought, had a fairly sophisticated financial system with good uh, people running it. it. Didn't turn out to be quite as good as we had been led to believe. But in some sense, the Chinese are facing what is widely regarded as uh, the potential for a financial crisis, perhaps with less, um, less expertise in handling them, although they do seem to have a few resources if they need them. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how big a risk you think there is in shadow banking or credit boom or housing and, and how well prepared you think they are to manage it if it hits. Yeah, D David, um, thanks and thank you all. It's, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, not surprisingly, that was a question I got a, a number of times in China. and. You know, my view is that, of course, every economic system known to man, every economy from time to time are going to have uh, financial crises. Uh, and the roots are almost always, probably always, in flawed government uh, policies. And uh, then they manifest themselves in the banking system. And the, of course, when you have an economy like the Chinese that relies on, to a large extent, on debt financing for, uh, for infrastructure, for real estate, for fixed uh, plant investment, uh, that the problem is inevitable. And they almost, they certainly are going to have uh, bad debts at the, and this in many ways is similar to what happened there in, in, in 98 and 2000. Um, the part of the bad debts are related actually to our financial crisis because of their fiscal stimulus program and policy bank lending. Um, part of it to, to, to shadow banking, uh, in investments that are, are you know, in that market to uh, often to the, to, the, to the private sector, and a lot of it uh, a municipal um, a funding. And so what, what I, the way I look at it is, is that first of all, I don't think anyone doubts that the, the capacity or the commitment they have to um, 
to, to prevent the failure of systemically important uh, companies. And today, the problem is limited to municipal, you know, municipalities, you know, local debt, and to uh, to state-owned enterprises. The the public, uh, you know, are, don't have leverage, and the central government has got uh, got a huge capacity. So today, I, I think the, the things that I tell the, the Chinese is they need in a, in, a, in a system with diffuse decision making, they need clear lines of authority and they need to make some tough decisions about what institutions are systemically important and which aren't, and when there are losses, how those should be shared among market participants, and they need to make it clear where the, where the government uh, is on the hook and where the government isn't. Uh, I'm not making light of the current situation. I think it's manageable. I think a m much more serious is the flawed government policies that have led to this, which need to be corrected. And here I would just point at two things. One is sort of that triangle between the banks, the government, and state-owned enterprises, and dealing with that. And then the other very significant problem is their system of municipal finance, which is overly reliant on real estate sales municipal governments taking land from the farmers, selling them to developers. And uh, they need a new system, and that's not sustainable. They need a new system of municipal finance. And it's easier said than done, because right now uh, they, it doesn't work, it won't work unless there's a new tax system and there's fiscal reform. Because what happens is mayors have huge obligations and they don't have access to uh, sources of revenue, uh, uh, enough sources of revenue. So what they're doing is they're you know, t t taking land and, and, and selling it and, and funding it in the, sh in the shadow banking market from banks on a short-term uh, short basis. So it's going to take a while to fix it. pretty big bumps on the way to a better system, you know? Well, yeah, Just like I, the state of Illinois, you know, they well, have some well, problems. Well, I, I would say the, uh, the, 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 the Chinese economy, I wouldn't compare with the state of Illinois, but, uh, you know, the state of Illinois is, we have some, some very significant problems, but China does, has, has their own problems, and, you know, I, I think they, like any economy, are going to have uh, bumps, you know, in, in the road. I mean, to, to, to step back and look at it even more broadly, uh, there is a huge need in China to, uh, to develop a new economic model. And the current, uh, uh, the Xi administration is committed to do just that and have have really put their credibility on the line and laid out really a very broad program to do that. But it's a lot easier said than done. I mean, to take a $9 trillion economy and, and develop a new economic model and rebalance it and do all the things they're going to do. So it's, I happen to think you, you can't do something like that with, without some you know, significant bumps along the way. To what extent has the Xi reforms translated into change in incentives for local governments. We talked a little this morning about how for a long time, if you wanted to be promoted, you had to produce growth and it was all in service of the national GDP target. The rhetoric at the top is for balanced growth and all this stuff, but have they changed the incentives for the local officials, do you think? I think it's going to take a while to do that. I think the incentives are critically important. Sure. The environment is an area where it sure looks like They've, they, they, they've changed it. That uh, they don't have the institutions they need uh, to uh, deal with environmental issues the way we do. They don't have a strong, uh, you know, the Ministry of Environmental Protection 
with regulations that can be enforced. So the, the approach that the Xi administration is using is making the environmental protection, clean air and clean water, an important part of the way they evaluate officials. So it used to be when you would meet with party secretaries and mayors, they would go through their litany of what they'd done with their GDP and, and job creation. And now, in addition to doing that, they're all talking about the environment. And if they believe that that's going to impact their career, what they do, and it's going to be a very important part of their performance evaluation, I think that will make a big difference. Do they get measurable targets, like reducing particulates or something like that, or is it? Uh, I, I, th that isn't clear, the extent to which that, but I, th th that is clearly something that needs to be done. And uh, I think that the, uh, I, I'm frankly encouraged because I don't believe it's rhetoric. Uh, the, uh, the, the party needs to, uh, needs to do this if, if it's going to uh, keep its credibility. Well, give, you've been working a lot on the environment in China. Give us some example of something that convinces you that this is more than just press releases from the top. Well, I, I've just given you, to, to me, the, 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 the best example I can give. I, 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 would, I would say that they've, uh, to step back even further, if you would, if five or 10 years ago, someone had told me, these are all the things that China's going to do in terms of investing in clean technologies and, and shutting down dirty plants, et cetera. I would have expected them to have made more progress. But what's happened is despite some pretty extraordinary steps they've taken, that they've, uh, it's all been, been blown away by this breakneck growth. Mm. And I, I think there's a real understanding today that the quality of the growth is, is much more important than just uh, ramping up GDP. And you know the Chinese people are demanding it. I mean, when when I'm there, it is the big issue. And remember, you know, I I, I was there at the end of February also. And when I was here at the end of February, you could hardly see the sun. And it was uh, the you know the TP two and a half rating. It's it's in the danger zone when it's above 300. And I, I had days when it was above 600. And remember, the leaders are right there in Beijing, breathing the same air. And uh, so there's a huge need. And you look what they're doing. They're doing important things with resource taxes and tax, experimenting with taxing carbon. They're doing a, a, a lot of things. And, and so there's, there's no doubt they're serious about it. Hmm. Uh, one of the things that you've mentioned to me, and it came up this morning, is in the, in the Xi uh, leadership period, the role of the party seems to have changed some. Talk a little bit about what you've noticed about the role of the party in through this leader as compared to the last couple. Well, I, I think the party has always been predominant in, in, in China. Um, I think some Americans, because when we talk about reform, uh, we're thinking that the Chinese, maybe in the back of our minds, some naive people are thinking they want, they're trying to create a system like we have. And so they, when, when they look at uh, you know, market-based reforms, uh, these are reforms that are good for China and good for us. And when you look at what they're doing in modernizing the government, it's good for China and good for us. But the party is predominant. And Xi Jinping, came from a very prominent and powerful uh, family in the Chinese Communist Party. And, um, and he sees a strong party as uh, part and parcel, is critical to, to his him being able to achieve, achieve successes in, in the reform areas he's pursuing. And, uh, you know, he sees the party as really the only strong institution. And so he's, he, he's in China, so he's done things and doing things to increase the credibility of the party. And 
a whole lot of things, including a, a very, very strong and, and uh, anti-corruption uh, campaign, but, but, but a number of steps. So he's tr making the party, and I, so as someone who's been going to Beijing for a long time, I hear in, in the conversation with officials, you hear the party mentioned much more frequently than in the past. Well, how is that? Is that uh, a substitute for government? Is he trying to break the gridlock of government that slowed things down? Well, and how do you build a strong government if the party is being is so much strengthened? Well, th that is the $64,000 question because what happens is a big, if you look at the reforms, most people in the U.S. and most of the press are focused on the economic reforms, which right. are very broad in scope and extraordinary, which is all about giving the market a decisive role and uh, things that are going to be very good for China and good for us. But there's also a huge agenda in terms of modernizing government and, uh, and the institutions of government, because China doesn't have the institutions, uh, the governmental institutions that it takes to govern a country is with an economy as big and as diverse as China. So there's a there's work on restructuring. So part of it is a structural issue. For instance, t take the the Ministry of Environmental Protection. Uh, you know, in certain areas, it's going to take more centralization, which is counterintuitive to many Americans who think of there already being too much uh, authority and, and top-down authority. But how do you uh, regulate the environment if it's not done centrally and when you have consistent rules at the local level that are enforced? Uh, part of it has to do with uh, the legal system. And, um, and uh, more due process and the, the rule of law and restructuring that, restructuring the disciplinary process, which, you know, Wang Shishong, uh, who was my counterpart in the SED, now heads up. But then there's sort of the catch-22 that you alluded to, which is the party probably is the only organization in, in China that is strong enough to, to, to get these things done. And because there's huge vested interests, there's going to be a lot of resistance. And she has really consolidated power to an, uh, really an unprecedented level, at least in, in my experience. And I, I think he's, he's going to need that to get it done. But maybe because the party is so strong, that's one of the reasons why we don't have, or they don't have the institutions and haven't built the institutions they need. You mentioned the anti-corruption campaign. Do you look at this as a, uh, a crude way for Xi to reward his friends and punish his enemies to say, since I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of people who are corrupt in China and you know if the leadership can always target you, that might make you a little more loyal. Or is it um, less about hard power and more about trying to clean up the system to keep the people uh, happy? Well, first of all, just for, for background for those, David, that haven't been following it as closely, that the, the, the led by Wang Xishong, who runs the Central Disciplinary Committee, there's been really a, a, a highly publicized um, uh, program to go after not just the, um, you know, to, to go after the tigers, not just the flies. And so some very senior people uh, you know, have, have, have been targeted, including Zhou Yang Kang, who used to, you know, a, a former standing committee member. Who right. Would, uh, and so, in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, first of all, there is no doubt in my mind when you look at the Chinese people and the issues that they care about, right up there with the environment is corruption, okay? property rights, clean air, clean water, yeah, food security, and corruption. And so there, there's no doubt that this, um, 
it, it, it increases the credibility of the party with the people. No doubt about that, number one. And number two, to the extent that some of the people being targeted are senior, you know, in, in, in some of the state-owned pillars of the economy, I, I think uh, will lessen resistance to some of the reforms. And, 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 but I also believe that they are very serious about, uh, about curbing corruption uh, for domestic and international credibility. And I think they understand that just, uh, although arresting people for past regret transgressions is certainly gonna strike fear in the heart of a, a lot of people and they're going to curb their behavior going forward, that, that this is a systemic issue and it's one that's gotta be, be changed and it's gotta be changed uh, through sort of long-term policies, emphasizing values and integrity, changing the incentive systems that you talked about, part of which will be paying underpaid government officials more for doing the jobs they need to do. Uh, part of it will be having clearer rules on anti-corruption and a legal system that is uh, more even as it in enforces the law. And I think a big part of it is doing what they want to do in terms of having the market play a bigger role in the economy and government playing a smaller role because I think the current system where the government plays such a big role uh, is again, is one that's, that's, that spawns corruption. So it sounds like you're saying they're kind of twin objectives and twin benefits of anti-corruption. One is it might make the system cleaner, more popular and work better. But on the other hand, if it happens to weaken resistance to reforms from the thing, well, that's just, that's not uh, such a bad thing either. Yeah, well, because. You will go after you if you to, 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 are not. Well, to, to get, uh, first of all, it, it, it strengthens the party, okay, in, 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 by in, in credibility. And also, there's, there, there's no doubt that, uh, that I think that, that, that some of the vested interests you know, in, in, in state-owned enterprises and other places. I, I think the fact that uh, some of those people have been uh, targeted uh, will, uh, will help uh, uh, get reforms done. Hmm. Now, I think the American view was always that you can't really have successful market-focused capitalism without also having political freedom. Uh, the Chinese leadership clearly doesn't buy that argument. Um, but do you see a tension there? Are they going to continue? Are they going to feel pressure to have more political freedom? Are these demonstrations a manifestation of a kind of restlessness among the Chinese people, or is it the alternatively, if they can deliver the goods and clean air and safe food for your kids, that and a few less re-education camps, that they can get away with having strong political controls? Well, to first of all, I, I would say that uh, right now. She is very popular in China, and most of the people, virtually all the people I talk about, talk to, are really focused on delivering the goods on these other things that are going to be very, very hard to deliver on. I mean, when you when you talk about the sorts of things that he's taking on, they're going to be very, very difficult. Uh, my own view has been for some time, and it continues to be, that the system is evolving and that, uh, that ultimately, as you move to have a market-driven economy that's as integrated as China is with the rest of the world, uh, the, China, the system needs to evolve to become more open and inclusive. It, it just, it, it really does. And so, I believe that, uh, that the government won't achieve the success that they expect it to achieve unless they, uh, they, they move in that direction. And I think there'll be, um, th there'll be pressure to move in that direction. This is a pragmatic leadership, you know, and, 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 and one of the reasons why I've gone to China as much as I have over the years is they are, when they're focused on, you know, their their economic objectives and reforms, and uh, that they are, are pragmatic, 
they're not locked into ideology. Uh, they're looking for what will work. And um, I, I, again, I think the, uh, the, the, the system will evolve and will need to evolve. When you worry about China, when you think about what could go wrong, what's on your, on your worry list? Well, the, you know, the, the, to me, the big picture is this. The big picture is that this is a country that, uh, that has accomplished an extraordinary amount over the last 30 years. And they've done it with an economic model that is run out of steam, in my judgment. It just plain isn't sustainable. And so you can get a bunch of economists, you, we can all sit around a room and talk about they gotta do this, that, and the other thing. You know? And when you talk about what they need to do in terms of uh, ref reforming the labor market, removing immigration restrictions, all of the various social reforms, the government reforms, the economic refor reforms in order to, to, uh, to uh, unleash the potential of the private sector, to rein in the state-owned enterprises, to reform the financial system. You know, a nine trillion dollar economy to, to change the, the model is, is, is a difficult thing to do. And, and so to me, the good news is the leaders understand it. It's not like talking to U.S. politicians sometimes where, you know, guess what, the problem doesn't exist or people are, I mean, when, when, you, when you talk with them, they're very pragmatic. They know the problem exists. They, hmm. they, they talk about it. So the question is, are they going to be able to get the things done? Because the, you've got, and, and, and here I'm going to make a, a a very big and an important point, probably the most important thing I think I will say, because when you look at the scope of, of, of the issue and the scale uh, that, that, that they've taken on and the personal credibility that, that she has put on the line, it's very unprecedented for a, a general party secretary to be the one that heads up this central reform, you know, leading group on economic reform. So they, they've, you know, they've, they've, they've taken it on. But the, the question is, it's so complex to do this, and they've, they've done a lot. How are we going to know whether they're going to be successful or not? And to me, it all comes down to competition, just as plain and simple as that. I mean, inside uh, China. It, 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 I'm going to define competition because economic competition. So the things I'm going to look at are, first of all, are they going to open up the key sectors to private sector competition? You know, when we're talking about energy, we're talking about finance. I think they will, but are they going to do that? Secondly, are they going to rein in the state-owned enterprises and continue the reform of them? which, which is, isn't an easy thing to do at the time when they're really underperforming and you take away their subsidies and their special advantages and their regulatory protections and put them on a level playing field and make them compete, it's gonna lead to, to, to unemployment in those areas. But it will, it, it, and I'll get back to what it'll do in a minute. And then thirdly, which I think is really important, is are they gonna open up to foreign competition? and I think that is critically important. There are two groups of reformers in China, the pseudo reformers, many of whom are the domestic companies that are all for competition as long as you, you know, let the foreign capital in but let us run our own companies. And so I, that's why I have been as focused as I have been on this bilateral investment treaty. Uh, because just like Zhu Ranji used WTO admission, you know, to drive economic reforms internally, that I, I think this is what the current uh, Xi government would like to do. I mean, to use the treaty to um, 
introduce more competition yeah, within just, China because that's what you'd have to do yeah, to get a sign. Yeah, because it benefits China tremendously in, in terms of increasing the efficiency. Uh, you're, I don't think the reforms will be as successful as, as they need to be without it. And it's the only way you're going to build healthy, strong uh, companies in China. Look what happened in every industry, where you, every country where you protect an industry. We protected our auto industry for years with an import quotas, and look what we got. And so it, it is, um, I, I just think that's critically important. So to me, what I worry about is this is such a big agenda. And there will be strong vested interests, ideological resistance, um, political resistance, that it's going to take some doing to get it done. And it's complex. How you sequence these reforms. Right, it's going to be difficult. If growth is slowing and they're worried about not creating enough jobs, and then you tell them we want you to take away the protections yeah. from these state-owned enterprises so they have to lay off workers. I could see the dynamic. Oh, oh, yeah. There will be right now. I mean, I've, I've been looking at what they've been saying about growth. And I, I was very encouraged by two things that Lee Ka-chung, the premier, said, uh, said recently when I was at Boal. First of all, you know, they're, they're um, you know, he's, he's, a, he's well aware that growth is slowing, slowing down, and I don't see them slipping back into their, you know, old patterns of, of a bunch of lending stimulus, building a, a lot of infrastructure, some of which isn't needed. And so I think they recognize you need higher quality growth. And then he announced this, um, this really, I looked at it as a, as a massive uh, pilot pro project or pro program between the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the Shanghai Exchange, which is going to lead to a lot of, of, of two-way uh, investment flow into each market. And I think it's something that, uh, if it works, could be replicated with uh, other uh, markets around the world. So they're serious about doing this, but what I think we all have to worry about is, uh, you know, how easy is it to, to, to get done? Hmm. One of the things I've noticed when I visit in China, not nearly as much as you, if you talk to very wealthy people, successful entrepreneurs, or companies that serve these people, I sense a great deal of insecurity among that they're afraid that they will be accused of corruption, or they all seem to be, I'm buying a house and Vancouver, I'm making sure my kid goes to Harvard and gets uh, a green card. It is, am I wrong about this? Do you, when you talk to private sector people, is there kind of insecurity about their future in China? Well, I, I, I wouldn't lump everybody together. There's really quite a vibrant private sector. And when I talk to my friends at <coughs> Tencent or with Jack Ma of, 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 of Alibaba, and look what they're doing in, you know, internet banking and, 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 and taking on the banks. There are a whole lot of private sector people are encouraged because they really believe that this is a government that understands the future uh, of, of the country is the private sector. Xi Jinping, wherever he was, uh, in every province, there was a big emphasis on the private sector as, as opposed to state-owned enterprises. And of course, there are other people that have accumulated a lot of wealth and, uh, and, 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 and people that have be really benefited from, you know, the you know, there were vested interests that have got concern. And then, and then I think anybody who is, who, who understands China, and I got to believe most people that are there, you know, understand it better than we do, uh, uh, recognize that th these reforms aren't going to be easy. What role does the People's Liberation Army play in the economic reforms? Are they 
an obstacle to this because they have our vested interest or not? Well, I, I would say that the uh, that as you look at uh, the state-owned enterprises or government-owned enterprises, you have um, you have a group of of central uh, uh, government-owned companies, and when I talk about state-owned enterprises, that's really what I've been focusing on. But there's basically 100,000 plus uh, entities in China, uh, you know, owned by with different pieces, owned by different the different uh, entities, and uh, uh, some of them, no doubt, owned by the PLA in addition to 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 um, to, to municipal governments and so on. And those entities need to be reformed. Uh, they are underperforming. Uh, I, I frankly think that they will be, and a lot of them will be broken up, be sold, be taken public, restructured, because you look at the, the pressure on municipal uh, governments uh, to pay down debt right now. And so I think that's going to be working in the in the favor, and but because they own some of these enterprises, so they can oh, sell them. Oh yeah. oh yeah, because I think one of the things that you know, when when um, municipal governments have been under pressure uh, to, to 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 fulfill their mandate, their go-to move has either been to take real estate and sell it to developers, or lean on a you know a a, a local. Uh, company which they own all or part of to build some infrastructure or do something some of which is is, is not commercial so I, I think there'll definitely be pressure let me turn you a little bit to the US what is it that you think the US should do either business or government to maximize the chances of successful reform in China that benefits them but also benefits us and the rest of the world yeah, see, I start off with the proposition that to achieve the important things we want to achieve globally in terms, you know, the economic objectives we have and the environmental objectives, that uh, uh, we want China to succeed with these reforms. Now, there are many people that don't agree with me and there are some people today that always thought that what was good for China economically are beginning to question it because the relationship is becoming more complex. I really believe now more than ever we need to, because of some of the, the tensions in the, in, in the national security area and the foreign policy area, it's really important to thicken that relationship. And so it, it's quite important that we have complementary policies. And the, the two things I would cite are, first, a bilateral investment treaty. But to, to step back even further, we have a lot of shared interests. We have some things where we've got differences. And we need to figure out how to manage those differences. We're going to be competing in certain areas. And in other areas, we need to figure out. We, we can't let that preclude cooperation where it, where it benefits both of us. And having shared interests is not enough unless you turn them into complementary policies. So I look at the bilateral investment treaty, and I look at it and say, if China uh, identifies those areas where there is not market access, that is going to add to the transparency and the predictability of the investment process. And then if they narrow those areas, rather than carving out big parts of their economy that aren't subject to, to competition, that's going to be really good for them in terms of helping them have a more efficient economy and speed up the reform process and build stronger companies. I think the U.S. Uh, needs to negotiate hard, but recognize that's a big step for, forward and take a reasonable approach on transition. And I believe that a bilateral investment treaty will also very significantly increase uh, U.S. investment in China because it's going to increase trust 
and understanding. And I actually think putting cross investment on an international treaty basis will take it to a larger extent away or help insulate it from the political cycle or the ups and downs and you know the tensions between the between Beijing and Washington. And so I, I think we should welcome Chinese investment to this country. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's very important. And then of course, in the environmental area, I think this is one that most people understand. I mean, part of the reason why the Paulson Institute works so hard on sustainable, uh, you know, a, a economic policies in, in, in China and the U.S. Uh, and sustainable urbanization is one of our thrusts, is the next several hundred million people. You know, it's, it's hard to even get your mind around that. Going to the cities in China is going to drive global, uh, not only economic outcomes, but environmental outcomes. And as we can't, it's very important that we have, I happen to, to believe climate is, is sort of the overriding social and economic issue of our day. That's what I believe. And I don't think there's anything we can do in the U.S. by ourselves to solve this problem. And having worked with a number of developing countries, I think the Chinese leadership gets this to a greater extent than any other major developing country I can find. And I think there's a huge opportunity as the two biggest emitters of carbon, uh, the p two biggest users of energy, for us to really work together and cooperate. And, and there's a natural fit. No one innovates like we do, right? Look at our national labs, look at our major universities, look at their, our, our te you know, look at Silicon Valley, look at all the financial legal infrastructure we have around that. No one can roll out and test new technologies quicker and has a faster growing energy market than the Chinese. But you know, what are we doing? We're exporting coal to them and we're slapping big uh, quotas on when they want to s sell us solar panels cheap. And so there's a lot of policies that are hard to explain unless you look at hmm. uh, politics, but there's, I think, a lot of room for cooperation. I think we can turn to questions. Uh, we have about maybe 10 minutes. Uh, there are a lot of people here, so tell us who you are and remember that a question ends with a question mark. Ma'am, can we have a mic over here? Stand up because it, the mic isn't working. So, narrowing the gap, narrowing the gap, um, and then, do you think that inability will benefit China in any way for them to pitch in uh, uh, potential future trade negotiations in the future, or does this TPP agreement will? Uh, what kind of uh, impact will this TPP agreement will have on China? So you're referring to the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the U.S. is trying to negotiate with a number of Asian countries, including Japan. And the question is, are the Chinese right. threatened by this? Right. Or so I, I would say, first of all, I happen to believe that it's very important uh, when dealing with China to be for us to be strong economically to fix our own you know, economy to, to, to be strong diplomatically and be too strong militarily. And, and it's particularly important to be strong economically, diplomatically, and militarily in, 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 in uh, Asia, number one. Number two, I see the TPP is very important, a top priority, because it's really focused on economic integration. It's not just looking at it across the border, it's looking at behind the border. and some of the you know, other restraints, moving some of the other restraints to, to competition. And I, I think that the, uh, if we get a high quality TPP, I, 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 you know, I would be surprised if the Chinese don't want to become part of it. And 
and I think we should uh, welcome the Chinese. I think uh, they would benefit, and we would all benefit. So, um, you know, that's, th that's my view, and I think you're starting to hear them talk more openly about being part of it. So we would, that, that is something else that would drive reform and be quite helpful. But do you think the Chinese attitude is that the U.S. has to choose between China and Japan, particularly militarily, or do they accept that we can be well, allies and partners of both? Well, they, you know, I'll look more broadly, then I'll come to Japan in a minute. I think very broadly, they absolutely accept we should, a relationship should be based on mutual respect and mutual interest, and that there'll be differences and, uh, and that those differences should be managed and not preclude cooperation. And, uh, but the, 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 this U.S.-Japan, excuse me, this uh, Chinese-Japan uh, tension and conflict is quite disturbing to me because I think that, the, uh, that there are two forces that are in conflict with each other. Uh, you see it in the Pacific. One, the need for economic integration and economic growth, which Japan needs, which China needs, all of Asia needs, we all benefit from. And what is in conflict is that, and putting that in jeopardy, are the, the, the political uh, tensions. And so to me, that is disturbing. You. Uh, it's just really, really important that um, that we have great communication. You know, and, and the, the U.S. government just keeps pushing. We have to have it at the at the political lead level, at the senior military level, and right down to the to, to, to the boat captain. So you don't uh, you don't have a conflict, and so it's that's I think very important. And there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of of of, of sentiment and nationalistic sentiment in both countries, and I wouldn't underestimate the significance of it. You know, I, when I uh, when, when I talk to some of my most uh, to some uh, some friends uh, in, in China, people that have gone to U.S. schools, people that have uh, that uh, have really admire our system and our country. Uh, and I raise that issue. Uh, they, you know, they talk about the, the the history and gee, we were allies in World War II. They were on the other side. We don't get it. But the fact is, we have a defense treaty with with Japan. They're an important ally. We on, on individual disputes, we we don't uh, take sides. We, we we try to be try to be neutral. But uh, this, th this tension is something I worry about, and it's, it, it's uh, you know, there's no doubt it's a concern. Over there in the back. Thank you. My name is Doug Paul from the Carnegie Endowment. Recently, the Treasury issued an advisory to China not to let its declining currency values um, get back into play when there's a concern about unemployment in China. And yet many independent economists say China's currency has been etching into being overvalued and really does need to make some adjustment. Who's right? Well, I, I look back and say that I look forward to the day when we don't have that debate. And the only time we're going to have not have it is when they have a market-determined currency, right? And they don't. So it's pretty clear to me, uh, only when they have a market de determined currency are they going to have really globally competitive capital markets. Are they going to have an economy that is where the market is playing a decisive role, they have the right price signals, are they going to be able to, to move up the value added chain, do all the things they want to do to rebalance their economy. And I'm not the only one that, that thinks that. There are plenty of Chinese leaders, including Zhou Xiaotran. So I always look at it and I say, well, you can do two things, right? You can keep intervening in the currency market, and, uh, or you can speed up moving to a, the process of moving to a market-determined currency. And if you keep intervening, what's going to happen? You're going to keep 
accumulating foreign exchange reserves. You're going to, uh, you're going to be funding these structural deficits in, in, in the U.S. and Japan, and you're not going to be rebalancing your economy. Or you can move ahead and do things that you need to do for your, for your economy. So I clearly think that they need to take action. Uh, this is always a hot budget, a uh, hot button issue in Washington, D.C. And one of the reasons I'm, you know, it's when I'm outside of Washington, D.C., I don't uh, talk as much about that because it's, it's, it's simple, it's easy to understand. And I don't think it is, I'm not downplaying the importance of currency. And, but I think even more important are the structural issues that lead to the imbalances, you know. The, the structural issues that cause them to oversave and the issues that we, we can't blame the Chinese for the fact that we borrow too much as a government and as a people and that we have policies that incent that. David Dollar's nodding, so he must, have, he must be doing well. Bob Keatley? It's coming. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, political reform, uh, being evolution is needed. Uh, but this comes at a time when China is cracking down on uh, uh, the flow of information, the internet, uh, right. media, people who even agitate in favor of government policy can find themselves in jail. Is this undermining the need for diversity, transparency, working against the economic policy? Well, as you, as you know, I'm, I'm an American, and I love our political system, and I've said pretty clearly, I think that, the, that I, I'd like to see, and I think it's important that they move towards something that's more open and more in, in, inclusive. And what, what you've seen is you've seen uh, the Xi administration at the same time, they've put out a whole set of reforms which, uh, w which are badly needed. They've also said we're going to uh, deal with a number of hot button issues, right? The one child policy, uh, labor, you know, re education camps, and then focus on the major issues of, of the food, water, air, uh, corruption. Et, et, et cetera. And they've done that at the same time that they've, uh, you know, that they've cracked down on the press and Weibo and some of the other things. And so they've, uh, the, the, you know, I, the, I look at it and I say their very strong view is that they're dealing with issues that the people care the most about today. But again, I, you know, I, I, I don't think that's a uh, w winning uh, a winning formula, and uh, and uh, I think that they will, uh, you know, o over time, that uh, they won't be as successful as they need to be unless they uh, unless they uh, have a more open, inclusive um, government. There's a woman here, and then the gentleman in the back by the camera. Thank you, Leah, from VOA. Um, as China embarks on those um, economic reforms, I'm just wondering if Secretary Paulson can talk about the sequencing of these reforms, especially in the financial reform area. Thank you. Yeah, the sequencing is very, very important of the reforms. Because, for instance, if you normalize the labor market, with, you know, and, and, uh, and let everyone migrate to the big cities and, um, and, and take their benefits with them, you would have them just flooding. You know, Beijing can't accommodate many more people, and Shanghai can't. So how they do that, and uh, what they're gonna do is they're gonna normalize the market for you know, second and third tier cities first. Uh, the financial market reform, you know, 
mayors are going to need budget responsibility, right? And, and have to be held accountable and have sources of revenue that they can call on. But right now, mayors don't have a uh, budget responsibility and, and they don't have financial statements that are transparent financial statements uh, that they can, which are required to have a municipal market. So if you need a municipal finance market, they've got a ways to go before they can get there because they're gonna have fiscal reform, tax reform, give uh, mayors the tools they need to, to, to manage a budget. So these are going to be very, that's why she has given himself, gave himself seven years from the time they announced these policies, which was you know, some time ago, to get them done because it's gonna take a while. So what I look at are what are the things that can be done soon and are they doing them? Okay, are they doing the things that they need to do right away? And I focus a lot on the financial markets. And the reason I do is these are things that have been studied, debated in China. Uh, they know what the issues are. And uh, so they, these reforms are very important. And here I start with the idea of letting uh, foreign financial institutions come in and compete because you're gonna need world-class institutions. And I've never ever seen a, a, a situation where I believe joint venture institutional investors or banks or investment banks work. It's hard enough to, to, to run one where you've, you have control. So you're never going to get there with joint ventures. So opening up, reforming the markets so that the capital is allocated to households and the private sector rather than state-owned enterprises. Moving, eliminating the caps on, uh, on interest rates that, that, that savers re receive. There's a whole list of things in terms of developing a corporate bond market. So those things are important. The other things I'm going to look at, as I said, competition, is are they moving quickly to do the tough things with the state-owned enterprises? It's, it's not gonna get easier as, as, as time goes on. And so now I've been quite encouraged by not only what they've said about the markets playing a decisive role, but some of the steps they've taken to roll back the red tape and the regulatory barriers that keep their private sector from getting in and competing in, in, in certain industries. So they've done, they've done a lot in terms of laying out a very ambitious program. They've moved very quickly in certain areas like the anti-corruption, I think, on the environment. Though we'll have to wait and see, and I think that's gonna take hey, some time. Let me ask you one final question, and I want you to think of, you're talking to an American worker. Yeah. And yes, uh, I understand that the air I breathe has something to do with the pollution that comes across the globe from China. But if I'm an American worker, my wages haven't gone up, my company has a lot of investments in China and they tell me it's good for me, but I'm not so sure about that. What, what do you say to American workers whose wages are stagnant, who see, who it's great if Goldman and Citi can do business in China, but what's in it for me? How do you tell, what do you say to them? Make them feel they have a mistake. Yeah, well, I, I would say, first of all, to, to the American worker, you know, the, the, the American worker is struggling in manufacturing, okay? And we have eight or nine times the output we had in, 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 in 1950 with the same number of workers uh, that we had then. And when I, when I go through plants in China right now, I see very similar things to what I see when I, the best companies in China and the U.S., which is I go through manufacturing plants, I don't see a lot of workers. I see robotics and technology. So I see technology, just as an aside, I'll get to your question. We need technological advances. It's driving productivity. But in almost every industry I, I look at, whether it's architecture, whether it's engineering, whether it's almost any, in any business, uh, technology and manufacturing is destroying jobs. So we as a U.S. 
need, I think, to really focus on this and focus on having the proper training programs, et cetera. But what I, what I say to people in the U.S., I think first and most importantly, we need to fix our own economy. You know, that is going to be the key to our relations with China and everything else. Everything starts with our own economic strength and the things we need to do to become competitive. And we could tick all these things off, and there's, there, there's a, 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 a good number of them. And then the other thing I would say to a U.S. worker, uh, we, we should be fighting to open up and continue to open up opportunities in, for U.S. products in China. And right now, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you talk with farmers and ranchers, it's an easy sell because, of course, they look at, at what's, what's happening and how fast that consumption engine is, is growing and the need to feed the, the, the Chinese people. It's no longer, you know, you mentioned Wall Street. I think it used to be Wall Street and, and a lot of the big global companies. But I, I think right now the constituents, you know, you, you see te tech, te you know, clean tech companies and, and, and technology, and at the state and city level, there's a lot of people that are looking for Chinese investment to come in. I was with a, a company in Fuzhou, you know, on, uh, on last Friday, which really wasn't that long ago. <laughs> you know, and and what is a leading manufacturer of auto glass, you know, the Fuyo Group. They just bought a huge plant in China, excuse me, in, in Ohio, Ohio. So, you know, and they're going to uh, look at hiring a thousand people. So I, I think that's what you, the, the case we need to make. Now I think it's a hard case and I sure don't want to be, be the one that's trying to say this directly to someone who's lost his job on a, on a plant. But I don't think there's a lot of jobs that are, if, if the products we're importing from China, by and large, are products that if we didn't import from China, we'd be importing elsewhere. There are exports to China are growing. They're, they're, that's the fastest growing area. But it's important, and that's why we have to fight so hard to open up these markets, and why I'm talking about competition. Okay, with that, please join me in thanking Hank Foster.